From OFS, I'm Doug Shapiro. This is the Imagine a Place podcast, where we explore the power of place and the role of design in our lives. Yeah. Hey, great having dinner with you last night. Um, I enjoyed the time together. I always do. And I'm so thrilled that you brought us here at the Pacers Stadium at Gainbridge Fieldhouse. You know, it's fun sitting here. I've been here working on this project uh, some form or fashion for like seven years now, six years. Oh my since, gosh. You know, I'm looking up. We did a Lexus off was the first project I did with them and then we transitioned back. So yeah, I've never actually sat here on, on center court, so. I mean, it's a, it's a unique perspective to, uh, to think about. It's probably not the perspective that you always imagine because you're putting <laughs> yeah. yourself in the, the shoes of the, you know, of the consumer. But yeah. I mean, seven years, a lot of what you do is relationship-based and a lot of these relationships are long lasting. I mean, I'm, I'm imagining you know, a career in architecture and design. You're you're a young kid growing up in Kansas, right? Rural Kansas, mm-hmm. and and now here you are designing stadiums. D- is this is this what you imagine doing, or is this <laughs> completely different? No. Um, when I was a senior in high school, I was going to major in accounting because I, I didn't know where I was going, um, to be truthful. And I watched a 60 Minutes on um, IDEO. And they were redesigning, I still remember, they were redesigning the shopping cart. And at that point, I said, you know what, I, I think I could do that. That looks pretty cool. So I'll quickly kind of navigating what options were um, on that. I remember them speaking heavily about Art Center. I was starting looking at schools. Um, you know, I decided to go to K-State, uh, go into their interior architecture, which the first year was open option, right, to study all, all the programs. Uh, Because I thought that would give me a basis for building a portfolio, right, to where I could go to the art center. That was just in my grant. That's what I had to do because that's what they told me on 60 Minutes, right? But um, (laughs) but anyway, so, yeah, the first semester, uh, I still credit um, a dear friend of both of ours, right, Neil Hubble. Uh, I I decided that after that first semester, it wasn't for me. Um, Hmm. There was a lot of all-nighters that I was not ready for. Uh, at that point, right, I needed I needed my sleep, uh, and I was like, you know what, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna transition. And Neil pulled me aside after that semester. I had already was already re-rolling, and he said, you know, just give it one more. He said, all I'm asking is give it one more. Just trust me. And had he not approached me and had that conversation, we we might be having a conversation, <laughs> but it wouldn't be here, right? It wouldn't be and here. It would be, it would be completely different. I mean, as crazy as that sounds, right? It's, yeah, it's, it's kind of funny that you have these like pinpointed moments of like forks in the road, yeah. right? Of course, Neil convincing you to stay, but, but honestly, just that 60 minute video, it's like- yeah, I was going to accounting, <laughs> Doug. Yeah. I was going to be an accountant. Did you ever think if you didn't see that video, like yeah. would it have definitely turned out differently? Don't you wonder like how many other people have that creative bone and they just never get a, that opportunity yeah, I mean, that and little it nudge. It takes a moment, right? It takes an opportunity. It takes seeing something, watching something. I think that's why, you know, for my wife and I growing up and, and uh, as we've raised our kids, right, it's all about experiences and opening their eyes to as many things as possible because you don't know, right? Um, the only obstacle is yourself. Uh, anything's possible. You just, hmm. you, you got to, you know, you got to go get it. So, well, Let's talk about go get it, okay? People that know you, I know you, they would describe you as driven. I think that's a, I mean, they've described you as a lot of positive things, but driven is one of them. I can't help but like draw some of the parallels between, you know, the way you approach your work, almost as if the way an athlete would approach their game, right? And now you're here, is there a level of competitiveness or (laughs) is that even the right word to use that you bring to the profession? Probably. I mean, you know, no one likes to lose. I think in our profession, though, it's it's about building relationships. And that's what's been most important to me is just, you know, focus on building relationships, focused on the impact that we can have um, and how what the little piece that we do, um, how it makes everybody else better for it. Right. 
Um, just, I mean, you know, translating that to an athlete, right? That, that hour and a half, right? There's two hours that they're here on the court performing, right? Performing, um, uh, showcasing their craft. It's bringing a, a joy, right? Uh, um, and an experience to, you know, 18, 20,000 people that are able to uh, leave their, their struggles, right? Their hardships, their day-to-day um, outside the door, right? And we're here for a good time, not worried about all the stresses of life. And, and you know, we're here for a common cause, right? Um, we're celebrating and having a great time. I, I think as, as designers, we have that ability and responsibility as well, right? We think about this, right? We're, we're sitting in the middle of, right? We're blessed to help impact. Um, every decision we make helps, yeah, alleviate someone's stress, right? Alleviate someone's pain point or heartache that might be having. Because for these two hours here, I mean, you know, for the concert or the uh, the basketball game or whatever the experience might be, that stuff's gone, right? That stuff's gone, and they're here wow. for this, and that's, that's pretty cool. I've never really thought about it that way, the kind of the therapy side of this <laughs> that it's like, you know, you get to live outside of the world in this this one moment, yeah, you think, know? You know, we, we're here. You think about other sports as well, right? And think about supporter sections and soccer. And, you know, I mean, people are there for a common cause, right? And you think of it, you're sitting there, you're with your family, you're with your friends, right? You're really focused on one thing. And everybody around you, especially especially today, right, in the, the world that we're in, I mean, everybody around you is here for the same reason, the same reason, right? And it's the one of the few places that that that, that happens. Man, I just got goosebumps from that. And it, and it really, I mean, that is, there is like a sense of just like brotherhood and sisterhood that happens when you're in a place together, rooting for the same thing. You, there's a lot of things I want to get into. You talked about relationships. I want to go there. You mm-hmm. talked about the you know experience. I want to talk about designing for that experience. But I first want to go back because you did mention your childhood growing mm-hmm. up in Kansas, and you know here we are in one of you know designing for these experiences for twenty thousand people coming together, very yeah. diverse experiences, diverse group of people. And do you ever do you ever think back on you know how maybe growing up in rural <laughs> Kansas even you know like how how does that play a role in kind of your view of the world and as you've grown and you've traveled and you've yeah. created these places, yeah. has it evolved or are there roots that you hang on to there? No, certainly. Um, I know it's funny. I mean, I grew up in a town of 2,200 people. Uh, I did not, you know, I never thought for a, for a minute, right? This is the opportunities that I would have, uh, the relationships that I would be building, um, the fact that I'd get to learn from uh, some of the most amazing leaders, right, um, uh, in sports, uh, you know, masterminds in, in terms of what they've been able to do for for um, for sports and, and for the world, um, you know, getting to sit in the same room as Jonathan Kraft and discuss, you know, I mean, it's, you know, Herb Simon here, you know, I mean, you, there's so much to learn and, and you're awestruck many times. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, I always say going back and I owe a lot to my parents, you know, it probably sounds cliche and cheesy, um, but they, you know, I was the oldest of three and I didn't get, let me get away with anything, um, you know, so they're very strict, but um, the uh, work ethic that they installed of me, right, um, to me very quickly um, has has allowed me, I think, uh, so many opportunities, something that we certainly are um, transitioning to our kids, right, that type of small town, you know, farming community, work ethic, right? You're, you know, you're working from the time, you know, I mean, we don't live on a farm, but, you know, you're working when you're, you're little, right? And there's an expectation and just uh, an earnest, you know, in terms of how you approach things and nothing's handed to you. And and so I've kind of always taken that with, that with me and it was certainly uh, has helped me along the way. Um, it's not been easy, right? Um, I didn't know, I, I didn't know high design, right? <laughs> like, you know, designing hospitality spaces. I, I didn't grow up in high design. You know, I didn't grow up um, knowing, and I'm blessed. I would never change it for, for a minute, right? Um, but yeah, I didn't grow up knowing, you know, the, the restaurants and the scenes of, you know, New York and Chicago and other places that I might sometime be, you know, someday being asked to, to design it back, design to, right? I mean, I think 
you know, one of the things that probably one of the hardest projects, but obviously, um, certainly one of the most important for me in terms of molding my career was Yankees. Right. So I was a kid. Right. I mean, I referred to, I was the kid, right. Been out of school for a few years, you know, grew up in the small town, went to, went to Kansas state, moved to Kansas city. Um, and then, you know, all of a sudden I'm working on Yankee stadium. Right. And, and so it, it was one of the best. I, you know, I often wondered if I'd still be around after that project. Um, was, was that like, like a pinch yourself like, moment? Kind of uh, like, not, is this not, real? No, it was, it was a, a big shot, a big BLS moment, right? Or um, it was definitely a big shot lesson, right? In terms of I, I didn't know, right? And I'm being asked to be in these rooms with, with people that have high expectations, that know what they want, and they're asking me who is is not you know um very um early right in a career and, and an experience in terms of what i had experienced and what i knew um to direct you know and assist with visions and so i had to grow up very quickly right i had to grow up very quickly um i had to learn to adapt i had to learn to figure it out um i mean it was one of the best things you know and i had an amazing team right at the end of the day like you're only as good as as the team around you right right, you're, right. Um, and as you grow, as your, tra um, your trajectory changes, your responsibility changes, you know, that becomes even more and more visible, um, and more and more critical, right? That you have to remember as, as a leader and as a designer, regardless of, of what your profession is, right? Um, that it's, it's the team around you. And so, you know, I had an amazing team that helped me, right? Like they never let me drown, right? They might, you know, let me fall, but you know, like, <laughs> you know, you always say I'm gonna let sure. the I'm gonna let the leash go as far as I can go, but I'm never gonna let go of the leash, right? And and I think that's, you know, I mean, it, there's several people and names I could mention on Populous and other places that kind of helped, right? And stayed right there with me that whole project and others to kind of help me grow and and figure it out and. You know, I, I learned what I didn't know, and I, I found out ways to, to go find it. I mean, did did you ever have, like, you you heard of imposter syndrome? Mm-hmm. Did you ever have, like, a moment where you felt like, I'm not, like, I'm, like, I don't deserve this. Like, I'm not good enough for this. Like, did that ever happen, or does it happen? Every day, right? Um, <laughs> no, I mean, we're, we can always be better, right? We're... We're only as good as yesterday. We you're always, so humble. We, no, it's accurate. I mean, we always be better, right? Um, yeah. I, I have been blessed to be in the right place and have amazing support support systems and trusted people around me, um, right? Because I, you know, I mean, I'm one person. There's so many people out that are much more talented than I am. Um, I've just been been blessed to to be able to navigate a bit, but. Yeah, I mean, you're, you know, every day is a new day. You got to pick it up. You got to learn from what you did yesterday, right? I, mean, I told you last night, it's never um, an issue. It's always an opportunity, right? right? We're human. We make mistakes. Um, we're trying to facilitate and orchestrate and coordinate massive things, right? Even, you know, whether it's a single club and all the details or it's it's a, a larger project. Oh, there's so many things. We're we're gonna miss something. I don't make say we do our, our our best not to, right? But um, we gotta we gotta take those. We gotta own them. Um, we gotta be, you know, on top of them. We gotta go fix them. Right? There are opportunities to do better, and that's how we approach it. All right, let's talk about designing for the human experience. Um, mm -hmm. You even mentioned experiences, you know, are important in your family and how you're raising your kids. Yeah. But designing for experience, is there something, because obviously this is paramount to what you do every day. Is there something that people often get wrong about that subject? I don't know how they get it wrong. I mean, I think the experience is what you make it, right? It's how you craft it. Um, everybody's experience is, is different. Uh, I think, you know, we we think through the experience from the time you leave your driveway, right, to the time you return. I think the things we're thinking about and the layers of your experience are changing mm. quickly, right? When you say layers, go deeper there, what do you mean by yeah, yeah? I mean, so, you know, uh, if, I, if I'm going to break down and I won't go there, but 
you know, at a high level, right? Of breaking down someone's experience from an interior's perspective, right? Uh, you know, I'm thinking about your experience, not just to your seat. I'm thinking about your experience to the restroom, your experience to a concession stand, right? Um, your experience in uh, transitioning through the security gates and the mags and, and, you know, your ticket. And, you know, I mean, we're thinking about all those interactions and each one is unique and each one starts at a different point and ends at a different place, right? Um, when I'm waiting in line, what, what's happening, right? I mean, Disney doesn't know, does it better than anyone, right? Um, so, you know, those are the things that we're trying to break down. And, and, you know, the experience for someone coming in and sitting in the upper deck is, should be just as memorable as the individual coming in, going to the lower suite level and, and spending, you know, the, uh, the game watching from the suite. Their right. experiences are different but they're both just as important, right? And as critical. And so, you know, we have to design for all those experiences, right? We have to design for, you know, there's there's 18,000 people here. We're not designing 18,000 experiences, certainly. We kind of are, right? But yeah, we're I mean, designing layers of experience, right? The people that are, that are sitting, blessed to be sitting here on the court, right? And they have access to clubs, their experience is different and their pathways are different. And when they're in the club, what's that experience, right? Um, and what's it like when they come back and forth, um, you know? So, I mean, all those layers, I guess, are, are what we're thinking about, right? But, you know, I also think about, you know, you're, you're talking about experience and the kids, right? I mean, I remember, I still never forget, right? We had the signs, I found them the other day. My daughter, we were, uh, the Royals were playing the first year, game seven of the World Series. Uh, I was in Regina, or Regina, Saskatchewan um, with the Rough Riders working on a project. So I didn't go to game seven. Um, they, uh, we watched it together. It, it was, it was really fun, but, um, my wife, you know, we had tickets. Um, they were, you know, I don't remember 20 rows, 30 rows up right behind home plate. Right. She took my daughter, right. She was, heck, I don't I mean grade school, right. Third grade right. probably, um, or 14 now. So and she has signs. Right? Thanks, Dad, for traveling, so I could go to Game Seven of the World Series. She oh spelled gosh. all the words wrong. <laughs> um, but that's what we're doing it for, right? right. We're creating right. experiences for people like that. Um, you know, I think about. I remember when we opened at Yankee Stadium, and Brad Crowley, a colleague, still works with us, uh, amazing leader. He, uh, we had extra tickets, you know, and there was a. I still remember a kid and a dad sitting on the steps. And Brad went up and you know, had a conversation with him. And the dad just said, I wanted my kid, I wanted my son to remember this. I didn't have tickets, I didn't have anything, right? But he wanted him to be a part of opening day of Yankee Stadium. Wow. They were sitting outside, right? And Brad said, well, you know, it would be much better inside and gave him two tickets, right? But you watch the kids' faces, right? You think about, like, the first time you went to, you know, you went to a, a game and what it was like, right? Um, oh, yeah. that's why we're doing it, right? We're, we're doing it for, to create not only, you know, experiences for people that might come in and out, you know, many times, but the person that, you know, what is their first time going to be like, right? What if they only get to come to, you know, for many people, right? People that come all the time, that's, that's an oddity. So for many people, you know, you may come to a basketball game once, twice, three times in your entire life, right? So yeah, one chance. I mean, I can speak from experience just like you can you know my kids you know lit up we we, we came to opening day here and and had that sort of yeah memorable experience um i want to talk about fatherhood before we go there let's talk about relationship building because relationships are are a huge part of what you do it's yeah. not like um you're in and out like you said you've been working on this experience over seven years and i'm sure it'll continue what advice might you have for, for the design profession when it comes to sustaining relationships? And well, That's good. I don't know that I know the answer um, other than, you know, just being being present. It's being present. Um, you know, it's, it's try to manage when you turn it on and off. Right? It's extremely important, but being present. Um, you know, the relationship here goes much, much longer than the seven years, right? It's, it's a bigger populous um, relationship. Uh, Mel Raines, you know, worked on the Super Bowl here, um, continued to work with our Super Bowl team, right? So she got to know Populous. She got to know another a different side of Populous, right? So an opportunity presented itself and, and she reached out and it just so happened that it, it aligned uh, 
with what I was doing at the time, and so so I came on board, right? But that relationship really was driven by by other people within our practice. Uh, but I think, you know, relationships during a project are one thing, and the relationship really starts when the project's over. Mm. I think, you know, oftentimes we, you know, you're on something, it's super um, aggressive, right? It's it's stressful, fast-paced, you know, we're all working together with the contractors and everything to get it done. And it's easy to say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm glad this is done. But it's not done. We just started, right? We, we get to walk away, right? I get to leave here. I get it on a plane. Um, the facilities team, everybody that works here at Gamebridge Field Austin, they have to navigate what we just did, right? right. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes ideas pan out exactly how, how we thought and other times they don't, right? Uh, so, so really it's just beginning, right? And we got to be present. We got to be present from, from day one, but also, you know, when the project's done and we're continuing, they have to live with it. So it has to work for them. Right. Well, we want a pretty picture. Um, what's most important is is how it's going to operate and how it's going to function, and how it's going to perform. So, you know, for me, it's important that we're constantly um, connected with with our clients and, and our partners, our friends, right, our relationships. I never stop working. Right. We're always looking at how we can improve something that was already done. I mean, we're doing that here all the time. Right. Like it's done. I can, you know, sit here and look around, and, and I could start creating lists of hey, we got to adjust that. We can do better here. We can. We're gonna do it better here, but I think it's yeah, it's being present, um, it's being available, yeah, right? it's being available, um, it's communicating. I mean, we all struggle to be better communicators, but I um, mean, communication is the key to everything. Um, it will make it or break it, you know, and and not just you know with our with our partners and our team members and the people we're privileged to, you know, privileged to have trust us to get to do what we do, but you know, inside the walls of populace, right? I mean, our projects are only successful uh, if we're over communicating, over collaborating, right? Yeah. You know, we have to constantly be, we can never assume, um, we can never assume anything. We always gotta, gotta be open and communicative. Well, I, I loved your comment around, you know, things are just starting when most people think they're ending. I think that's great advice for a lot of things. Yeah. Um, you and I talk a lot about fatherhood. We've, yeah. we've talked about the joys of fatherhood, you know, the difficult decisions, the advice we love to give. Yeah. What has fatherhood taught you? <laughs> that, I mean, well, that's a big question. Yeah. Okay. What has fatherhood taught you that you bring into your career? Oh, lots of things. I mean, it certainly, you know, makes you grow up. Right? Um, you know, I travel a lot. Uh, I, I, I mean, at the end of the day, um, I, probably the the most important piece um to the puzzle for me right and, and i answer your question but is my wife right like i have an amazing support system um and without my wife uh, i wouldn't be able to do anything right because because uh the responsibility that comes with being a parent right it's amazing but we have very active kids and you know my wife sacrifices a lot right and takes on a lot to allow me to be on the road a lot right so um, with all of the travels that I do, the one thing it's taught me is that when I, when I am on the road, when I'm here, I am, I'm present and fully invested in this team, right? In this organization. Uh, and, and that's extremely important to me to give them my all, right? And, and make sure we're over delivering. But also, you know, that 24 seven, that's focused here so that when I get back to Kansas City, right? Um, I'm not going back to the studio and, and spending the weekend trying to, right? Like I've, I've allowed, you know, that focus so that when I'm back home, I can be back home, right? And, and I can be focused on, on the kids and, my, you know, the family um, and, and really spending that time, right? Trying to find that balance. It's extremely difficult. It's extremely difficult. Yeah, I feel like everyone's trying to figure out this balance. <laughs> And maybe the answer People will is, say I'm the worst at it. Yeah, well, I'm just thinking maybe the answer is not in the balance itself, yeah. but it's in focus. Like yeah. if you can focus, maybe that's the key to creating balance, right? Because, because you can be efficient when you focus. You can be efficient with your work so much so that when you're with your family, you're not so concerned with it or distracted. Where do you like to spend your energy as a designer? So that's a good question. Um, you know, I mean, there's so many layers of the process, 
Right. Right. So many steps from from finish to end. I think I still and I've always it's a reason I travel. Um, I'm always a believer that I can't solve a problem from afar. Right. Uh, I can't solve a problem um, sitting in Kansas City if the problem is active. So that's something that I I really love. Um, you know, as you get older, though, uh, I think getting to you know mentoring right and helping um grow uh younger designers younger you know consultants uh, is certainly extremely important to me um really important because it makes it makes all of us better right yeah you had this concept that you shared with me last night plus one <laughs> right yeah that was I wouldn't say i came up with plus one right lots well, of people have always have always told me i have a plus one uh it's so important uh, you know, you get to, like I was saying, right? You always think we can we can handle everything. I mean, we're one person, right? We're one person. We all need to sleep. We can accomplish a lot um, individually, but we can accomplish the world collectively. Uh, I believe that. And so, you know, something I've really focused on and you know, focusing more this year probably than ever is a plus one. You know, certainly if I'm traveling somewhere like here, you know, it, it, it might be a bit different, but if I'm headed to a meeting, if we're uh, going to talk about a project, if we're just going to visit a client that you know just happened to be in the area, and we're going to come by see how the project's doing, I always try to take a plus one. Um, you know, I you always need an extra set. I think you get busy. You know, you get asked to be, or you're here, you can't be somewhere else, and that doesn't mean that that we should be saying no. That doesn't mean that um, I shouldn't be able to provide the same service to a client. You know, if they ask, it should have a plan, right? And so plus one is the first step in that is saying, hey, I, you know, I can't be on that call. But remember Doug who came and walked with me two weeks ago? Oh, yeah, he was great. He's going to lead the call, right? Right after the call, we'll, we'll catch up. But, you know, so having it's it's plus one, it's a plan B, right? I mean, we're. Yeah, it's a mentorship. We need, we need a team, too, right? right? You need a team. And, and if I can't be there, you should be able to step in and it shouldn't matter. You know, it should be lock and step. We should be seamless and vice versa. So. I love it. I love it. It's a it's a neat strategy. I also believe it feeds right into mentorship yeah. in terms of creating exposure and that sort of thing. You know, you mentioned you like to be here. You like to immerse yourself yeah. in the problem you're trying to solve. I want to ask about your imagination process, okay? Because these are these are grand areas. These are big big experiences we're designing. You're designing. And and I wonder are you when you, when you imagine are you the kind of hands-on imagination where you where you want to be the crowd, be the consumer, or are you the, in this kind of meditative, you know, like close your eyes and put yourself in their shoes? Like, how do you imagine? Yeah, that's a good question. Everybody, I think, approaches it differently. Um, you know, for me, listening is is often the first step, mm. right? Because we're we're solving a problem and, and, you know, people come in and they see, you know, the cool sculptures and the, you know, cool, uh, pretty finishes and things like that, right? That really make it a space right? and give it the energy and, and makes it memorable and makes you want to come back again and again and again. Um, but really it starts with getting the program right. Because if hmm. the program's not, if the space doesn't work, it may look cool for a few minutes, but then we'll fail because it doesn't work, right? It has to work for everybody that comes in, for everybody that has to use it every single day. So for me, the first step is listening, listening to our client, listening to the end user, um, right? Understanding really what they need, what's working. Well, you know, here is an amazing opportunity. It's a renovation. So they've they've been able to live with something for 20 years. You know, many of them you know, here um, much of that time and so it's so critical to hear what's working and what wasn't working because mm. we're the focus of the renovation is improving, right? Not just fan experience, but improving the operations and the success in our eye of the building. So uh, for me, it's listening. But yeah, I, you know, you love to walk through when you can. I think it's different if you're building new um, renovation. It certainly gives you an opportunity to be a be a fan, right? Be a part of the experience, kind of understand where the pitch points are because it's your time to fix it and make it better. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, when you're, when I'm doing new or doing more of a club, it's really putting yourself in the, the, the body of the individual that's going to go there, right? And so, you know, here's the demographic, here's the clientele, here's where they're coming from. Um, what is their, you know, 
residential experience look like, right? And when you come here, we want to be better than that. So mm. what does that look like? I think it's a lot of, it's a lot of visiting. Um, There's a lot of city pride too. Yeah, that happens, oh, so right? much. Yeah, I think a lot of visiting and, and all goes, you know, we're telling stories of cities, of states, of country, but um, for, for demographics, uh, depending on where we're designing, um, but visiting and you talk about, you know, growing up in a small town. I mean, one of the things that was very important and I was supported by, you know, Larry Peterson and Earl and lots of people that, that are still with the practice and some are not. I mean, I spent a lot of time going to cities and just visiting restaurants and visiting well done hospitality spaces and retail and, and going to other facilities and learning about what, what was good and what wasn't good. And we still do that, right? Every project. I mean, you start with the, the experiential piece of, okay, here's what we're creating in this city. And we got to go see everything that's around, right? I and love ask, that. like, what, you know, ask our clients, um, you know, what spaces have you visited? Because, you know, our, our clients are, are, you know, in a lot of different cities, right, with their teams. And, and so they're, they have unique experiences. And, and there are things that have stuck with them that we need to go see, right? We need to go experience all of that. But, you know, I think the, you know, the other piece of that whole equation is when we're designing, we're designing as a team. Mm. And, you know, that whole listening isn't just listening to our client, but it's it's listening to everyone else because we all um, embrace, we all go about breaking things down differently. And, you know, that's one of the, the coolest things to think about what we get to do is sitting in a room. At a, you know, when we were a prime here, um, populous, you know, you know, and we led an amazing, we're still leading an amazing consultant team of, of local and national consultants. But well, we had over a dozen, we had almost 16 people on this project. So 16 different minds that are thinking about things, some, you know, very heavy on design, some more on, you know, the, the program and some, you know, I mean, they all have different perspectives and pathways, but, you know, a lot of times, I mean, a lot of times we just need to shut up and listen, right? We don't always have to have the answer. Uh, sometimes it's easier said than done, right? We don't have to have the answer. Yeah. We often don't have the answer. Yeah. If we just listen and allow the team that is around you, you know, to, to, you know, throw out, it, usually it's there, right? We just yeah. need to sometimes step back and, and allow it to come to the table. I think there's this, there's this thing about meetings, business meetings that make people not want to share. I yeah. mean, I feel like judgment usually gets in the way and I've pinpointed judgment as kind of creativity's enemy, you know? And how do you create that environment that's free of judgment? Where literally we're in these meetings and we're sharing, you know, ideas yeah. freely. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, it's building relationships, it's trust, um, it's repetitiveness, right? It'd be very difficult if mm -hmm. I was gonna come present the, the story of the, of the 67 Club and you had never met me before. But you know, this, this kid shows up, right? It's, this individual shows up and they're saying, here's what your new club's going to look like. And here's the story and here's the experience. And they're sitting there going, I don't know him from, from the guy, you know, next, the individual next door. Right. Um, so, I mean, you know, it, it starts with that trust and that, you know, I think day one, it's very important that you have as many people and you can't always send people to meetings. Right. But right. Zoom and, and teams have really opened the door for a lot of things. Um, and we've had, we had to embrace them. Right. We've had them for a while, but we've had to embrace them in the last couple of years. Um, but I think, you know, just the more people you can be present because the more you see, and that's not just internal, I'm talking with the client, right? The, right. the more time you as a client see me at a meeting, even if I'm not presenting, but you see, and you know, you know, kind of know what my role is and you start to see me, uh, more and more you get more comfortable right and yeah. it's like okay he's a part of the team he's in the circle right somebody told me very very early that you know uh, our job was to get in the inner circle right and, and that's you know we want to build trust and have have that two-way street where you know you're not going to make a decision without asking me and, and vice versa right and we fully trust each other but I, I think the word i don't like the word meeting um we have Lots of meetings. I mean, look yeah. at my kind of lots of meetings. We have meetings to have meetings about meetings, but um, I I like work sessions. Right? Ooh, okay. I like work sessions. That implies um, something more yeah, active. It, it, right? it implies, right? When you see that, um, you know, and in the invite that this is a work session to you, right? What's a work session? A work session is I'm going to roll up my sleeves. We're going to throw out some ideas. We're going to be wrong more than we're right. And we're going to come out with a path, right, to the next one. 
Um, to me, a meeting is very formal, right? Yeah, um, yeah. I'm dressing different at a meeting than a work session, right? Yeah. People are going to sit there and they're either going to say yes or no, right? Work session so, might have big pizza in the middle of the table. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it could have anything, right? Um, you know, so I think it's, you know, a lot of those are formalities, but they're important, right? Just you yeah. think about the whole approach. How do you approach it? How do you... And I think we um, are blessed at Populous. We work with a lot of third-party people to help kind of coach us, right? Um, you know, how we present, how we how we go about leading, all those things. And I think one of the things that, you know, on meetings is that we, we try to cram so much, right? We try yeah. to do too many. And one of the best things and the lessons learned, and I've taken it here, and um, it was in Wrigley. We, we did, you know, blessed to work on Wrigley Field and that renovation and the interiors and we started that out with um, the three individuals that were really going to drive into decisions for for the Cubs. We said, we're going to meet every week. And everybody's like, you're going to meet every week. You're never going to accomplish anything. Um, but we met every week. We didn't always meet in person. Um, meetings always didn't always take two hours, right? Sometimes right. they were 30 minutes. But we met every week. It was a work session. It was a work Love session. That. It was a conversation. Sometimes it was about family. Sometimes it wasn't even about the project. But... We, we grew together, we trusted each other, and we broke down very quickly the layers of, there, there was a judgment-free zone, and that, that's what a meeting should be, right? Like, yeah. I, I mean, if as a designer, you're, you're wrong more than you're right, right? And you probably should be because- Gosh, that's super because interesting. If I come present an idea to you, that's my vision, right? That's why team is so important. It's an idea. Um, and it's a starting point. And so you're going to have thoughts on it. You know, 20 people should have thoughts on it. And it's always, you know, you can have too many cooks in a kitchen, right? But um, it's a starting point. And, and you got to go from that and allow, you know, it's it's more than you. You're you're a starting point. And then you got to allow everybody to be involved to truly get the story right. I, I love that, that comment. As a designer, you're wrong more than you're right. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we go there enough. We talk about that. But it's like there has to be more paper in the trash than, than on the table. You know, like yeah. there has to be a process. There has to be wrongs. I mean, you have to Yeah, there will. I that. mean, there will, right? If we ever got to a point where there wasn't, then it's time to do something, something else, I suppose. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's the process. That's how we get better. I mean, we, we take what we did yesterday, right? Or what we did here at another facility. And we, we use that as a lessons learned, right? That's why the relationship never ends. I mean, I'm, you know, we wrap up this project, phase three, the end of this year. I'll still be talking to Mel and Scott and Doug and the team weekly, bi-weekly. What's not working? What do we, you know, what do we need to improve? I mean, you're invested so much time. You're part of the team, right? Um, you're part of the team. You're part of their organization. Um, and you have you have a responsibility to to help them be successful in, in this, this piece of it. But. I love that. I absolutely love that. What's the best advice you've ever received? And take your time with this if you need to. <laughs> um, no, I would say the best advice I ever received. I've received a lot of amazing advice. Um, piece of advice that certainly has molded me uh, was uh, Sean Henry with the National Predators. Um, you know, I'm blessed to still work with, with him. And this was many years, probably about 10 or 11 years now. You know, he he made a comment um, to me, you know, about the importance of, of knowing your client. And, you know, it's, and that stuck with me, right? Like we, you, our clients are hiring us, they're trusting us to help them tell the story, right? At the end of the day, they felt for this project, we were better to tell their story than anyone else. So we need to know their story, right? We need to know the story. We need to know the team, how the team's doing, who the players are, right? But there's a story behind this piece <laughs> of advice, right? Yeah, I mean, there, there is. I right? like he he asked me a question and I didn't know the answer. Um, and ever since that point, I I know the teams, right? I I know how the team is doing. I know who's doing well. I know who, you know. And, and it was the best. It was the best question or best conversation, um, because it really uh, allowed me to this day to refocus. Um, you know and or not refocus, but really focus and be a part of, of that, you know, and really pay attention to the details, pay attention to the organization, uh, who they are. Um, you know, people who know me will say, I use the word we a lot when I'm talking to clients or talking about projects that I'm working on, you know, 
Um, oh, I work, I, for, I work for populists, but you know, <laughs> you know, you say the pace is only like we, you know. But yeah, I mean, to me, that's important, right? They, we're part of the team, right? We're part of their team. Um, they're part of ours. We're part of theirs. Um, you know, I may be, we may be on the populist payroll and not Pacers payroll or the National Predators payroll or, you know, stadium payroll, whatever it might be, but we're part of their team and, yeah. and we have the same responsibility to deliver just like anybody within that organization does. And once I was reminded of that, the approach that I took has, has forever been different and I'm grateful every day for, for that. <laughs> big that lesson yeah yeah and you know honestly for someone to ask you that question and then tell you you need to know these things they must have already felt comfortable and they must have already felt like you were part of the team to have that moment with I you so. but that is a cool moment to carry with you and, and to well, pass and on yeah and you it's something you know i talk about with people all the time right we get on airplanes and, and we go to visit clients and people that may not you know, haven't worked on the project, don't, you know, just remind, hey, let's, you know, let's do a little bit of homework, right? Let's take the time to, to catch up. Um, it's it's important to walk in. If we walk in and you should, you should know what our record is, right? You should yeah. know what our record is. You should know um, how we're doing if we're going to make the playoffs. You should know that we played last night and won or lost. You should know that we played last night and how we did, right? Yeah. And that was the thing. I mean, you know, if, if you ask me, I should be prepared to answer. I should know that. And I like how you said how we did. There yeah. you go with the we's again. <laughs> um, all right. I was imagining this moment sitting with you. Okay. So I was very prepared. Um, you're a busy guy, but was there a question that you hoped I would ask you? Oh, I don't know. There's probably questions I hoped you wouldn't ask me. <laughs> well, let's have one no, of those. I, I don't know what that, yeah, I'm not, I'm not prepared for that. No, I, I don't know. You know, I mean, I, I'm not I'm not sure if there, there's one that I hoped. I mean, you know, you've there's certainly I mean, the advice question, I think, is important because, you know, those moments that you're talking about before, like the moments when I was a senior in high school, and I was going to go up major ac accounting. Right. Those those are those are the, the pivotal moment moments, I think, as we get older, um, a bit wiser, maybe those are the moments that we need to really think about and and help. Um, educate navigate i mean we're all mentors right um we've been blessed to do here we, we certainly can never take it for granted um i think you know every, when you get when you get worn out right we all do you get worn out you get tired you just got to step back and, and kind of look around right <laughs> like we're pretty lucky um we reminded you know our kids everybody of that all the time but um you know i i think though but it's it's now using those stories um and serving as a mentor, not only for people within populace and younger designers that, that we're blessed to hire and work with, but, you know, for me, as you know, working with universities is extremely important. And, you know, having the comp just going and, and talking with them, not just critiquing, but talking with them and, and saying, hey, you know, don't say no, figure it out, right? Because because you taking on that on when you really didn't want to, or you really burn out, just opened another door. And you don't know yeah. where that door is going to go. But if you said no, you closed it, right? And so, you know, don't say no. Um, go intern, right? You don't have to get paid to intern. I mean, just call somebody up and say, can we shadow you for a couple of days because I'm in town, right? You know, so, so I, you know, I've been blessed to have a lot of people that shared those things with me um, that helped guide me to get me where where I am right and where I want to go because I mean, we we're all just getting started at least I am just getting started but where we all want to go and what we want to accomplish so now it's very important that we we make sure that we are the next generation you know that to help educate and guide those after because someday we're gonna we're gonna be done right and, and we want this profession to grow we want the the practice of sports architecture to continue to grow. It's going to look much different, right? I'm going to talk about that. It's going to look much different. Um, you know, there may be less people in the seats in 20 years. Who knows, right? Maybe all digital. But uh, I think that's very important that we or we take the time to to give back. Um, I think that's the best word, right, is yeah. giving back. And, and that's that's something that trying to, to make time to do. Well, in the spirit of don't say no, Hey, Aaron, would you roll a ball I, over I here? I should say no for the first time, is what you're telling me? No, no, no. No. 
In the spirit of don't say no, yeah. I have a proposal for you. Okay. I shoot a three. Yeah. If I uh, if I make it, yeah. I get to ask you one last question. Okay. If I miss it, you get to ask me a question. Okay. All right, here we go. Here we go. We'll count it. It wasn't a three, but we'll go for it. Okay, so I loved hearing about, you know, growing up in this town, yeah. 2000. I'm wondering, you think back on that young boy, right? Mm -hmm. He's out there now. Yeah. She's out there now, yeah. whoever it is. Yeah. And they're watching this and they're like, well, how do I get from here to there? What would you tell them? Anybody, anybody can be anything or any person they want, right? Um, it's, it's really um, on yourself. It's, it's believing. Um, it's never saying no. It's uh, knowing the hard work pays off. Um, you know, whether you're you're in a big city or a small town, right? We've talked about this to my kids. I think it's, it's very much parallel to your question. Um, there's always somebody out there outworking you. You take that philosophy, um, the doors will open, right? And, and you will, will continue on that, that path regardless of where you started. Um, it's, it's, it's a mindset, right? It's a mindset and a trust and a process um, and a belief, right? A belief that oh, I can be there. If you enjoyed today's episode, we would really appreciate a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening. To discover more design stories, visit us at OFS.com backslash imagine a place. From OFS, I'm Doug Shapiro, and you've been listening to Imagine a Place. <laughs>